If you've got to go into a substation, um, first of all, you're going to call your dispatcher and let them know you're going into sub. Um, second of all, you've got to have all that PPE right there to go in. You've got to have flame retardant, hard hat, vest. Well, you don't have to have the vest. Some companies require it. Um, boots, uh, some may require rubber gloves, leather gloves, but that's basically what you have to have to go into a, a substation. Uh, with Duke, whenever I would go, we have one substation here in Andrews. When I would go into the sub, of course I'd call them, let them know, but then when I unlocked the gate and went in, I had to lock that gate back behind me so nobody else um, could come in. And just to <clears throat> tell you how easy it is for somebody to come in, I had the substation locked out one night, went in there and it was pitch black dark. So I'm in there checking for targets on the um, controls in there. And I felt something behind me and a guy that used to work with, he'd retired. He was a retired engineer that lived in town a couple blocks from me. He had came in, I didn't even hear him come in and he was standing right behind me inside the sub. So you wanna make sure you, you, you take all safety measures, not just for yourself, but for the public as well, because I've had a bunch of first responders when that happens, they knew where the sub was at. Um, you guys that, that do that working for the fire department, these guys would come, you know, when they would start to, you know, walk into the gate and I'd have to stop and say, oh, you know, stay outside. You know, you're not supposed to be in here. You, you're not um, equipped with the right equipment to come into the group. Um, just be very vigilant of that. Make sure you follow your company's procedure as entering the substation, um, just like we talked about yesterday, because there are low hanging wires and there's not as high as what's out in the field. Um, there's some very, um, uh, how to say, um, explosive equipment in there that could become re-energized and short out. Um, we've had, we have in on the Duke system in my sub, I had, didn't have the three single phase regulators. At the breaker, I had one big regulator um, behind the bus, it was, and it would regulate the whole bus in the sub right there on the secondary, on the, um, the load side or the line side that fed the breaker. But anyway, um, we've had those, it has a panel on it. It has lots of bolts that hold it in, probably 50 bolts that hold this half inch thick panel, steel panel on the, on the um, regulator. And um, they've, seen these things short out and blow that steel panel off the side of the regulator. So you want to do everything you can, make sure you protect yourself, know your equipment and your subs um, and what you're doing with it. Professor Schumacher. Uh, well, you're getting into, and I don't know if you guys have paid very close attention, but you notice the past uh, couple of safety meetings here, we're getting to a theme of working a lot in, in substations and doing substation work. And that's what we're going to be going into today. And the safety aspect of substation, uh, Professor V has hit on you know, everything that's going on in there. And it's kind of one of those things, uh, you know, we've got plenty of stories we can tell. I was in uh, downtown Myrtle Beach and got called out in downtown Myrtle Beach to a substation that was uh, completely out. No uh, power to it whatsoever, which is typically a transmission problem. I got inside the substation. Uh, our, our rule was we had to close the gate and latch it. We didn't have to lock it back behind us just in case we needed to do a quick, quick escape. And uh, was doing some inspections there with a, uh, you know, big flashlight walking around the substation looking inside. And uh, I wasn't paying attention either and uh, closely to what was going on at the gate and turned around and uh, a, uh, you've seen these vans for uh, news stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a van for a news station was starting to haul into the substation. They opened the gate, was driving through, and they've got those big old satellite mm. telescopic things. It wasn't up, but it was high enough. He ran into the bus with the van and uh, caused some damages in there. Uh, luckily, it was de-energized. So it just goes to show that it, uh, in those situations like that, you got to be really vigilant inside a substation, be very safe. I can get you this, and I know this is going to happen to you guys. Even if you're working with a crew or going with somebody, the, the pressure is going to be on. 
if you, if you're in a substation, typically it's because power's out. And when you have power out and it originates or is a problem at a substation, it's a lot of power out. Uh, thousands of people, uh, up to tens of thousands of people, maybe out without power. And the pressure is on for you to get the power restored. Guys, sit back, assess, take your time and be safe. Uh, Surfside substation, which is about four minutes from me here. Uh, this is about 10, 12 years ago, had a uh, problem inside the substation and the dispatchers called me to go check it out. And they said, uh, you know, we've lost a good portion of power. It looks like we have a problem with the switch in the substation. Could you go check it out? Well, when I got over there, uh, the fire department had 544 closed in front of the substation, uh, four lanes of traffic. And uh, I could see the electrical arcing and the fire and the smoke going up in the air. Well, the dispatcher's instructions were, I need you to go into the substation and open a switch. Well, what do you think my reply was? No, thank you. Exactly, exactly. A dispatcher can see what they can see. They can't see what's going on in front of you. All they know is this is happening. This is how I can isolate it. I need you to do this. You gentlemen in any situation where you get an instruction from a dispatcher or from somebody that's not on scene, you are your own safety monitor. If you do not feel it's safe enough and you get an instruction to do something, you say, no, I do not feel it is safe. And you'll have to follow, they'll have to follow a different course for you to be safe, to be working in those conditions. I've seen Plenty of times where I've heard on the radio and I've listened to different commands given by a dispatcher or a crew supervisor where I've said, no, wait, let me take a look at it, let us assess it, and then we'll carry on with business. So don't get pressured into anything that you think is unsafe. Anything else there, Mr. B? Yeah, I'm just, just to add to that, um, you know, the, the past, I, I would say the last at least, 10 to 12 years of my career, I, I very rarely went into a substation due to the fact that since um, Y2K in 2000, um, they went to all, just about total automation and all our subs. So um, and that, that was good, but it was not so good in a way that um, you didn't, you weren't really so familiar with the subs anymore, um, but it was good aspect for us you know, something happening, uh, feeder lockout, and you had to go patrol a feeder, and then you could call dispatch back. You were out in the field and say, okay, I found a problem, re-energize the breaker, those kinds of things. But it has its good sides, bad sides, but, uh, you know, I kind of miss going in and, for, you know, and being really familiar with the um, controls in the, um, the breakers themselves. But, um, and we'll go through that a little bit later. Yeah, it's kind of surprising. You know, I've spoken with Professor V about this before. And uh, Safety Cooper's mindset about 20 years ago was to take the lineman and the lineman was uh, gonna be a specialist at his job, both overhead and underground. But they also cross-trained a lineman to be able to read meters, uh, do uh, secondary metering, uh, go into substations and assist in substation work. They weren't considered to be a specialist at it, but if any of those other departments needed assistance, they could call on alignment to be able to do that. And uh, uh, it seems like in Robbie's case, in Duke Energy's case, uh, they wanted to keep that sectionalized. That's correct. Yeah, substation people were only allowed to be in a substation and relay people were only allowed to do relay work, which is, in, uh, you know, big companies, okay. But uh, Safety Cooper wants their alignment to be versatile. Yeah, uh, I mean, the distribution linemen, especially during a storm, are going to do some transmission work. And transmission linemen during a storm are going to be doing some distribution work. Uh, I can refer back to Hurricane Hugo. Hurricane Hugo wiped out the state. The state of South Carolina was in the black. Uh, and that was due to the so many transmission lines being hurt. Well, that's the backbone of the electrical network. You can't, have, you can't have distribution without transmission. So what do you think the distribution linemen did? Transmission. They went with transmission, transmission crews. They went with transmission crews. 
first distribution, what distribution did the first day that we were allowed back into the area was patrol all of transmission lines, okay? And take down where the damaged area was. The next day was we were to get with transmission crews and restore transmission lines. And once that was complete, we went back and started restoring the distribution lines. Now, once transmission was complete, and I'm talking, you know, one, two, three weeks into the restoration effort, transmission crews, systems back on, it's back to normal. They started working with distribution crews. So it's kind of one of those ways of, you know, how you're going to work in, in the uh, working concept, the working way of the company that you're going to be working for. Yeah. Okay. Any questions there? All right, don't get, you know, when I talk like that, don't get disrupted and think it's your responsibility to have all the knowledge that you need to have in every aspect of a utility. When substation maintenance, and that's a certain, that's a different division within your company calls you up and says, uh, I need three people off the line crew to come assist at a substation because we've had some major damage. They know that you don't know everything that's going on in a substation. So they're going to help you. They're going to train you. They're going to, you know, get you doing things that you're able to do. They're not going to overextend you and they're not going to uh, have, you know, the high expectations of a normal substation person. Regardless of that, 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 hold on one second, Paul. Regardless of that, that's where we're headed into today. We at least need you guys to know the basics of how a substation works and what its properties are. Go ahead, Paul. I, I wasn't saying anything. Uh, I thought I saw you go green. It must have just been uh, a little bit of activity going on. Yeah, my sniffing or something. <laughs> okay. I did have one, I did have one question. Yes, sir. Um, so the outer perimeter of a substation, the fencing, that's energized in some way or another. Correct. What happens on an uh, uh, overhead distribution system and transmission system there is, if the fault is intense enough. It, and it's a phase to ground fault. So I'm going either the phase of primary to the neutral or the phase to the pole ground or actually the earth itself, especially in coastal areas where the uh, ground is sandy and it has a high resistance. That fault is gonna try to disperse itself in earth and around the entire electrical system. It's just gonna try to disperse. It's like step potential, but at a very long range. And you have to remember it's following what let's ask this question of everybody the pole ground and a ground rod is that ground the copper wire that comes down the pole and the ground rod that goes into the dirt is that actual ground no yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. that's going down into the earth and that's the copper wire uh that's attaching to it and it's the copper wire on the pole that's actually going into the earth what is the neutral What is the neutral wire? Any guesses? Okay, I'll, I'll put it out there. And this is this is going to come up later on in, in tests. You know, you got you got the ball rolling on. The neutral, all its purpose is, is to link all the grounds. It's the transport from ground to ground to ground to ground. Does that make sense? Yeah. I can't have an yeah. I can't, yeah, I can't have a pole ground and a ground rod at one location and not be able to link it to the next pole and ground rod or to the transformer in the ground rod. So the neutral itself is the transport or it's the interleaking conductor for all the grounds on your system. That's what the neutral line is for. Okay? So back to what we were talking about, if the fault is intense enough, and when we talk faults, you know, we're talking, talking 30, 40, 50, 60,000 amps goes into the dirt, it's gonna try to, it's not gonna try to, it's going to follow the neutral. It's wanting to disperse and it's using the neutral network to disperse itself out. <coughs> Especially if a fault occurs close to the substation, where is the fence tied into? When we saw that video the other day, the guy, what do they ground the fence? It's grounded in the grid. Right. And where's the grid grounded to? 
I'd reckon the neutral. There you go. So it's trying to disperse and it, you know, it hasn't completely dispersed on that fault current and you're gonna get a slight jolt there on the fence. It's, it's trying to disperse itself entire, on the entire system, but it hasn't totally dispersed until the fault is over with. Does that answer your question, Paul? It does, but the next part of my question is, um, how is the gate, how is the gates any different to the fence for you to approach if the fence is- They, they aren't, every, every, they aren't. Everything's grounded. Okay. All right. I mean, you bring up a good point there. Essentially, if a fault occurs, especially close to the substation, you're going to need to open the gate with your rubber gloves and you're going to need to walk around anything you touch inside a substation, you're going to need rubber gloves for. Okay. Right? That so does make sense. So technically you would need rubber gloves all the time if you're going to enter the substation because you got to open the gates and touch the perimeter. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the, the thing that, that's going on out there, faults on an electrical system are not supposed to happen all the time. Uh, <laughs> The, the potential for them can. And I know I told you about the story that we had down there, Merle's Inlet. We were expecting a fault to occur. We were working on the lines trying to find the fault. And when my boss said, get off the fence, you know, he, they were in expectation that a fault would occur on that circuit. Typically, faults don't occur on a circuit all the time. Uh, system reliability, when I left Myrtle Beach, as far as, you know, accidental outages and outages that involved faults were the system was available 99.994 percent of the time so that kind of gives you an idea you've got that 0 0.006 potential of a fault occurring and power being out all right appreciate all right. It. good yeah great question okay and professor anybody else on the video professor v anything else you would like to add i'm good Okay, sounds great. Well, we do, and like we said, we're starting on a good theme here. We're in substations, and that's exactly where we're heading in ELW-231. It's about electrical power systems and how they operate. Uh, this is good stuff, guys. Good stuff for you guys to learn, and you're going to need to know it when you get out into your jobs and careers. The first thing I want to bring up, and I'm going to bring up a share screen here. Um, you're in love. Okay, so do we know who's talking? Briggs. Briggs, you are so distorted, it's unreadable. No, still. Uh, how about now? Better. Can y'all hear me better now? Yes, we can. Uh, is this video going to be uploaded that way? <laughs> okay. okay, I muted him. No, we, we don't have any uh, concern about the Loch Ness Monster. All right, Jim, I'm going to share a screen here. Let's go ahead and start at the top and get some uh, information in you so you know what we're talking about when we get into future stuff. Got it. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's there. Your screen shares there. Oh, I'm sorry. I unshared it. Oh, <laughs> that was me. About bad. Okay. So, in your notes, and we're going to be talking about this frequently SCADA, S C A D A, Supervisory Control and data acquisition. Now it's not exclusive to the electric utility, although you elect, most of your electric utilities do use it. Uh, know what the acronym, acronym means. Supervisory, control, and data acquisition. It's a computer system, and I'm gonna go ahead and add to this communication system for gathering and analyzing real-time data. SCADA systems are used to monitor and control a plant or equipment in industries such as telecommunications, water and waste control, energy, oil and gas refining and transportation. SCADA really is the communication and control backbone 
for the equipment that you have out there in the field. How does SCADA work? A SCADA system gathers information such as where a leak on a pipeline has occurred, transfers the information back to a central site, alerting the home station that the leak has occurred, carrying out necessary analysis and control, such as determining if the leak is critical and displaying that information in a logical and organized fashion. SCADA systems can be relatively simple, such as one that monitors environmental conditions of a small office building or incredibly complex, such as a system that monitors all the activity in a nuclear power plant or the activity of a municipal water system. SCADA systems were first used in the 1960s. Santee Cooper introduced the use of, SCADA, of a SCADA system in 1982. And of course, uh, through that process of 1982 to now, has steadily increased the functionality and technology in that network. So let me get you another picture here. Now this typically is happening in your dispatch centers or your control centers, I'll show you this image. This is a rather simplistic one. What you have is dispatchers that are sitting in a control center that have these huge monitors and screens that are monitoring the electrical system. Uh, they're able to open and close switches. They're able to open and close breakers on the system. Uh, they're monitoring and typically what happens in situations where you have like substations, that's where we are today. They, they don't have to sit back here and watch just numbers go by every day. Thresholds are set. And if a threshold is met or exceeded, they're gonna get an alarm. Say the transformer in the substation is overheating. They're gonna get an alarm here and they're gonna dispatch somebody out to it. Say they have a breaker that's open in a substation. They're gonna get an alarm of that, which breaker operated or opened. And they're gonna send crews out there in dispatch to uh, uh, patrol that breaker, patrol that feeder line for that breaker and get repairs. They're also able to, and I, you remember in the description, what else can they do other than monitor? Supervisory. Control. Control, all right? So that they need to open or close breakers or switches in a substation if they're SCADA capable, if it's a switch that has a control to do that, they're able to open and close switches and open and close breakers inside substations or even out on the field to be able to uh, isolate lines or re-energize lines in an electrical network system. It's, if they if they can open and control everything from that system, is that what Mr. Vermin was talking about? Things being fully automated? Yes, yes. Now, uh, I'm, I'm sure of this. It depends on the complexity of the SCADA system you have within your company. Uh, some, some SCADA systems are simply monitor and limited control. Some SCADA systems are uh, monitor and have more control. It depends what you want to put on your system. Uh, the monitor part, and Professor V can uh, jump in on this also, is really critical in your SCADA systems. Uh, if you don't have monitoring and you don't monitor the major components of equipment that are in your system, then you're really not utilizing the system as you should. I mean, you can see this, and this, to be honest with you guys, is relatively small in a SCADA system, but they are watching and monitoring a lot of information. Yeah. And there's, I mean, I've been to the control, to the DCC, which is the distribution control center in Raleigh a few times and was able to sit with dispatchers in pods and there was probably, um, they probably have on staff at one time during the day, probably 20 to 25 dispatchers. And what you see on your screen there is very similar to what they, they look at. Um, they're put up, you know, putting pods and they monitor um, several hundred, you know, stations within their region that they're looking at. And they can actually, you know, like Professor Shoemaker said, they can open and close breakers, they monitor I mean, I've had plenty of calls where they've called me and said, hey, the 
115 Bank and Andrews is overheating. We need you to go check and see what, you know, if you can see a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's very sophisticated what they do with it, with the monitoring. And it also, you know, finds, gives you an idea of where your faults at on feeder lockouts mm -hmm. as well out in the field. But it's very, it's a very good piece of equipment. These are highly trained people. A lot of um, the Duke dispatchers are just linemen that were ready to get out of um, the, the lineman field just maybe because their body's failing them and they get going to dispatch with a lot of knowledge. And on top of that, they have to learn a lot, you know, as well on the other end of dispatch. So very, very um, good uh, equipment, what they're putting out there these days to help you linemen uh, find faults. Mm -hmm. uh I've, I've, we've had some linemen graduate that have continued on to the engineering courses within the, on the electrical side within the college that are now dispatchers. Yeah. Uh, not that many. I'd say, you know, we're on what, 230 students right now, probably about a dozen have made it in the, into the dispatch and control center. Uh, and they, I have to admit that their, their mind was geared for it. I, I'm not a person that liked to work inside, although I was fascinated and when, just like we had said before, uh, dispatchers and the dispatch center want, did want to have linemen and crew supervisors come in there and frequently look at, see what they were doing. <laughs> it was kind of a, they really didn't want you working controls on the computers. Right. But they did want you to know, hey, if I've got this type of situation, this is what I need to do. And it was kind of, it was one of those situations where you got a good working knowledge of what your dispatchers were doing for you. Just like I said before, and this is what a guy is looking at. And I know it's kind of blurry on the screen, but this is a pretty good quality picture. Yeah. If something happens on this screen, he's going to get an indication, a flashing indication here. And he's also going to get it on his desktop. When he's got that flashing indication, it's also going to give him a recommendation. If I open this switch here and I open this switch here, I can isolate the problem. So what do you think his instructions are going to be? Scott, I need you to run down to Surfside substation and I need to open switch one, two, three, four, five, and four, five, six, seven, eight, and that will isolate the problem. This is all he has seen. He has not seen the explosions going on and the, and the wire on the ground and all the arcing that's happening. He's just going to give you a recommendation. You are the final say out there in the field, you're the man on the ground to say, no, I don't agree with you. It's unsafe to do that. Can you find me an alternative method? I, I want to emphasize that. Question, question? Why don't they install cameras that they can monitor? <laughs> we do, we did have some monitors and in, in, in substations. Uh, what about you, Robbie? Yeah. they. They had uh, mostly had cameras in the substations that were very rural, um, where it didn't have a whole lot of traffic in and out of it, those kinds of things. But for the most part, the ones in the big, uh, bigger cities and towns didn't have them. Right. Uh, and we, we found in a couple of substations where we installed cameras, when you got power on the substation, well, guess what's out? The camera. The camera. Yeah. All right. Two is, and I don't know, you know, a couple of locations it worked well. Uh, and a couple of locations of uh, people would throw rocks at them, you know, throw sheets over them. I, it, it just kind of, they really didn't catch on very well. Do they use um, drones like what you were using out in the field nowadays to kind of help give a visual? Uh, typically right now, and, and as far as our company is concerned, and Robbie can jump in here for Duke. We only use drones for patrolling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if there was an area we knew we couldn't get into and we need to get down in there, uh, we would patrol it. And another thing that we were doing and while we we're in the substation part is, you know, so, uh, tr substation transformers, the most piece, expensive piece of equipment that's in there, you need to do a visual inspection of the top of the transformer. Hold on one second. All right. I've seen, I've seen fire departments using them more. Now. Right. So. The, the, the top of this transformer is about 40 feet in the air. Right. So you're not, and they, you want to do it energized. 
okay? You don't, you don't want to have to de-energize this and just to do a visual inspection. So you can't throw a ladder up on it, start crawling around on the top of this thing. They'll take a drone and fly it around the top and they'll do a visual inspection with a drone. Okay. Okay. Same thing would do. Most, most of the time when they use drones, it is for patrolling, like Professor Shoemaker said, those um, areas that weren't easily accessible, but they do some. They just started getting into more of that um, when I retired. Um, they love technology. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So let's get back to this and get back to the, uh, the SCADA part of it. Okay. Probably makes things a lot easier nowadays, as opposed to uh, what it used to be. It makes the things a lot easier on you. And uh, remember what it has there in the description real time. You're getting right. real time information. Now, they would call them points, they call them, uh, you know, Information points. St. Pete Cooper, when I left, had uh, 183 substations. Mm. That's a lot of substations. They love to build a substation. And there was, of course, hundreds, if not thousands, of different points inside a substation to monitor. Uh, that's, I know, don't know if you heard it before, that's what they call data overload or information overload. Okay. What's happening on, on the computers that are at the uh, main dispatch center, they're, they're monitoring everything all the time. Only a computer can do it. But once an event occurs, say a problem occurs, it takes priority over all of that information gathering and it alerts the dispatcher of what's going on. So it is a real sophisticated system. And I have to admit, uh, it will get into it later. A lot of work that needed to be due inside to be done inside substations uh, for you to have a safe work out there in the field used to have to be do, done by hand. You had yeah. to send a crew member or a supervisor into a substation, do something for you before you could start a work, and it took a massive amount of time. Okay, what time are we looking at? Nine forty-one. Yep. Let's go ahead. We got the skating part done. Let's go ahead and take a break there for about ten minutes, and we'll return at nine fifty. 941 now, we return at 950. Okay, gentlemen, we are back. <laughs> As stated before, we're gonna be going to the substations. Uh, I've looked on the internet before and what I'm gonna show you here and draw out for you here on a share screen in just a moment is a uh, diagram, a, a simple diagram of a substation. And uh, it's like what they call a single line. If you were to see on a drawing diagram, uh, the ones you see on the internet are, uh, at least to say, very elaborate and confusing. So we're going to draw one out here, and they're going to we're going to go across the uh, major components that are inside a substation for a substation to work. So I'm going to share screen on the side over here. Professor, are you able to see that? Yep. Okay. So I'm gonna start, we're gonna go left to right here. The first component that we have in a substation that comes into the substation is the transmission line. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw these as they would be drawn in an electrical system as far as the symbology, do you guys remember what this symbol is? If I, okay, I'm gonna come down here at the bottom. I'm gonna just draw the symbol twice. Is that an open switch? Okay. Ah. You see down here at the bottom what I've drawn, because I have to designate a switch on a diagram, I've got that arm that comes up right here in this area. That designates the switch as a whole. When I put the O in it, now it's an open point. Understood? Yes, sir. Okay. So right now, looking at the switch that we have right here at this location, that switch is closed. If I'm on, if I'm on diagram, I put an O in it, and that's what's on my diagram. Now that switch is open.
Thank you, Z. Uh -huh. okay. All right. So this first switch that we come to right here is called the high side switch. The reason why we call it high side is because it's on the leading in and it's the higher voltage that's coming into the substation, high side switch. The next component that we come to, and I'm still gonna use the switch symbology here, change colors, is called an ACI. Automatic circuit interrupter. Automatic circuit interrupter. Any ideas of what its purpose is? Take this word interrupter and put it in front of circuit. What does it do? Interrupts the circuit. <laughs> exactly. It interrupts the circuit. All right, do I need to be there to do it? <laughs> no. No, it's automatic, okay? It's automatic and we'll get into the methods of how it's automatic here in just a little bit. Next component that I come to in the substation is the substation transformer. Remember, XFMR is the acronym for transformer. New switch. If this was the high side switch on this side, what do you think the, high, the, the name of this switch is? on the lower side of the transformer. Remember, I'm transforming voltages here from transmission. Low side. Low side. Exactly, exactly. I'm transforming voltages here from transmission to distribution. This is the low side switch. Is it open or closed? Closed. Okay, closed. All right, I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna branch off. When I'm in a substation and I'm using these components to go in different direction, this is called bus. Bus or bus bar. I know this is a diagram. We'll go into pictures here in just a moment. I continue my bus. One, two, three. And I'll do the same over here. One, two, three. I'm going to go ahead and add the four. Okay, I'm gonna add a switch at every single point in this bus. Okay, each one of these switches that I have at this location is called the bus side disconnect. The disconnect switch is on the bus side. Next, and I'll just put a B in here for symbology. That is the distribution breaker. Okay. I also have coming off of it, another switch.
if all of these switches were bus side disconnects, what are we going to call the ones that are on the line side? Bus side, side line side. side. side there you go. Line side disconnects. And there's a reason for all these switches and we'll go to in just a moment. Okay, after the line side disconnect, you have a, and there's three per breaker. Voltage regulator. What do you think the purpose of a voltage regulator is? Flip the words. Regulate voltage. There you go, it regulates voltage. Then after the voltage regulator, it goes out on to your feeder circuits. Now, put this right here. Voltage regulator, three per breaker. How many phases do we have in overhead feeders? Three. There you go, three. When I drew this bus at transmission line, three phases, uh, the automatic circuit interrupter is a three phase piece of equipment. The substation transformer is a three phase piece of equipment. All of this is three phase running through here, even though I'm drawing just one single line. What does that say? Voltage regulator, three per? Three per breaker, B-R-E-K-E-R. -E -E Your screen's going all fuzzy. Okay, sorry about that. It's all right. And then we have, and I'll come out and just do them down for each, each one of these. Feeder line. This is where it's going out in, uh, into my distribution system. Okay, that's a simplistic drawing of a single transformer substation with the major components. There's a lot of more components that are gonna be added to this, but these are the major ones that are inside the substation that I want you guys to be able to identify. And I, I know this kind of lurking back in your heads. I bet we're gonna to have to do a presentation, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna happen. So let me unshare this screen. And yes, this is recorded. So you'll be able to refer back to this in a recording. Let me unshare this screen. And we'll go to show you the actual photographs of each one of these items. Share screen. And I've kind of got it scattered all over the place. So you should be showing my web browser. Uh, no? Yes. Yes. OK, good. All right, let's see, because these things aren't named correctly, let me go to, ah, perfect. Yeah. So if you look behind me right here, I have the transmission line that's coming into the substation. This is what they call a high side switch. So I've got transmission bus coming into the switch, excuse me, transmission lines coming into the switch, goes through the switch, through this connection. And then I have bus coming back out of the switch on this side. You'll notice down here at the bottom, you see that piece of conduit? Yeah. This is one of three switches. So I'm able to open all three, all three switches at one time. High side switch. Wow. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Okay, next component in the system is what they called an automatic circuit interrupter. All right, this is what they call, and if we'll get some search terms going in here for it. An automatic circuit interrupter, very, very expensive piece of equipment. And let me, let me go back to this other one. All right, the high size switch is not SCADA controlled. So I have no motor operation here. I have to do everything here manually to be able to open and close this switch. Is it fused? It is not. Good question. How do you open and close it? There's a, this bar right here that goes across. Right. It's hooked to a pipe that's got a handle on the ground. 
and you rotate a handle around. Once you rotate that handle and it is marked open, close. Once you rotate that handle, these arms swing out sideways. Okay. Okay. Through this uh, gear control here at the bottom of the box. You'll notice, and back to your question, I've got conductor in a solid metal piece of copper going across, then a solid metal piece of copper, then going to the bus. It's an isolation point. And we'll talk why here in just a little bit and the properties of the switch. What's the best, and let's go back to this one. What's the best conductor there is that we can use on an electrical system? Metal wise. Silver. Silver. This is all made of copper. I've got aluminum coming in. I've got a copper tube right here. This is actually a finger, what they call a finger and jaw connection. So once this thing starts to close, this arm is gonna go into these fingers and then it's gonna tighten down on itself. All of this assembly in here is silver plated. So that's where you're getting that nice, good connection going right through there, All right? Not fused, no protection going on right here. Let's see if I can get back to the one that I had. There you go. All right, the Mark V, and there's other brand names, circuit interrupter. It does exactly what it's expected to do. It interrupts the circuit automatically. Uh, it's kind of hard. Well, you can see it down here at the bottom of the picture. It's motor controlled. This is the motor control that you see down here at the bottom. It is also linked by SCADA, which we talked about before. And it's also linked within the substation. So if there is a fault on the transformer or beyond up to the breaker, a signal is going to be sent to this, and this will automatically open up the circuit. Remember, our transformer in the substation is the most expensive piece of equipment I have in my electrical system outside of the generating station. So in distribution, that transformer needs to have a lot of protection on it, and it needs to be real fast. All right, you'll notice on the ACI here, this one is open. How can I tell? It's straight up and down. Right. When closed, this arm lays into this connection right here. You see these jaws that are right here. Lays forward, coming forward. Right. It just falls straight down in and lays in these jaw connections right here. Even though this is the electrical connection, all right, you'll see these three components right here. One, two, three. And in this tube, notice and understand the conductor comes in here, goes through this insulated tube and then to the bar, all right? The switch does not open or close when operating correctly until an open and close is made in or close is made inside this tube. This is what they call a load make, load break switch. This is filled with what they call SF6 gas. So the arc is extinguished or made in this tube first, then the arm is either open or closed. So this is a load make, load break switch. You got to consider, <laughs> you're picking up with that transformer, potentially tens of thousands of customers at one time, or if we have a fault, we have to break fault current. You can't do that with a metal bar in the air. You can't do that with aluminum bar. The load has to be broken inside these tubes. All right. Once again, SCADA controlled, automatic. All three phases operate at one time. Any questions there? Um, if you lose power to the substation, um, can the dispatch still use the automatic system to open and close switches? Absolutely. If so, how is it separate power? Going to oh, excellent question. We've shown a couple of safety videos out there before uh, with that control house. What's in the control house along with other stuff? It's, it's part of the safety. They've had it in all the safety videos thus far. Obviously, you've got controls, right? So you can control stuff. What else is in there that's a potential danger? Batteries. 
batteries. Hey, you bring up the question, and it was, it was supposed to come up a little bit later once we got through this. We'll go ahead and go through it now. All of your substation automated equipment, including the communications in SCADA, does not run off of 12240. Uh, a 12240 transformer is installed in a substation to charge a battery bank, and that battery bank stays at 48 volts DC. That 48 volts DC then runs all of your equipment. The expected expect plan is for 24 hours until the batteries are depleted. So you're able to do uh, protection. You're able to open and close switches. You're able to do monitoring for hopefully 24 hours on that battery bank. So 12240 does not control a substation in a sense that if I lose power to the substation, I lose all communications and control. No, it charges a battery bank and that battery bank is gonna give you hopefully 24 hours worth of monitoring control in that station. Is that your question? Yeah. All right, uh, if you go outside of the 24 hour period or SCADA is monitoring your battery bank voltage, if that battery bank voltage starts going down, you can actually pull a generator in there and you pull a generator in until you're able to get full power restored and have a generator charging those banks. Good question. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, there's numbers at the end of this ACI. Can you read those? Three, two, and one. Three, two, one. Well, what does that designate phase wise? A, B, and C. B, and C. There you go. There you go. Okay. Next component. Low side switch. If you'll notice on the, see if I get back to it right away. Nope. I know. If you'll notice on the high side switch, you know, there's a, is a depth perception going. The insulators on this thing are meant for the transmission voltage. And we'll just say, and this looks like a 115 kV switch. The insulators are designed for the operating voltage that's going into it. On your low side switch, and it's because we're closer to it, the low side switch insulators are going to be somewhat smaller. All right, can I operate all three phases at one time? You'll notice this motor control, handle control. Can I open? Yes. All? Yeah, yes, you can. Okay. Since this is on the low side of the transformer, as you went by in your di diagram, I don't need automation here. It's not required. Some people do have it, but it's not required. I'll have automation here. So this is gonna be mounted on a structure or a pole, steel pole typically, and I'm gonna have a handle going down to the ground where I'm ready to open and close this. Okay, so let's, we're not going anywhere. Let's stop here and find out why I have to have both a high switch, an ACI, and a low side switch in this situation. So I'm gonna bounce back to the drawing. Okay, so what we have gone through thus far, let me get my little stick back. We have talked about and viewed the pictures for the high side switch. Let me get colors going on here. The high side switch, the automatic circuit interrupter, and the low side switch. Now this goes, I know it seems like it's gonna be a lot of equipment and we haven't even got to the bus yet. It goes into the practices of safety when you're working on the, these pieces of equipment. For in order for me to work on anything inside this zone, you'll notice I'm starting at the, at the uh, high side switch and I'm stopping at the low side switch. For me to be able to work on safely anything inside this zoned area, I have to have, note this, pay attention to this closely, two visual open points. With two visual open point switches, I'm now allowed to go into this area between the high side switch here 
and the low side switch here, ground it and perform any work. That is an OSHA requirement. And I'm sure Professor V is gonna agree, a company requirement. Correct. Okay. Uh, why can't I just open the ACI here and go to work? Because you got residual energy in the transformer and everything ahead of it? No. No? No. Once I take transmission voltage, <laughs> transmission line, and let's say there's this high side switch. Let me erase this right here. You're talking about just working on the transformer, right? Uh, well, anything. Okay. I mean, think of it. If I take away transmission voltage here, sorry about that. Where's my pencil? If I remove transmission voltage <laughs> and from this point beyond, is everything beyond de-energized? Yeah. It is. I have no voltage coming into the transformer anymore. So everything going out is de-energized. Can I go ahead and start working here? Even if you say yes, I understand we're learning this process. Yes, no. Look at your diagram. No. Why not? You only have one open point. Right. I only have one open point, plus I have lowered the scope of my zone. Okay. In order for me to work now from this point and beyond, I have to get another visual open point. That's on the low side switch. Okay, to me working in this zone. Now I tell you, if you're gonna get that part done, and this is this is the concept and the working solution for uh, Santee Cooper. Some companies don't use a high side switch. If I'm gonna work on the transformer in all my substations, or I have to perform work on it. I'm gonna go ahead and include a high side switch all, all the time because while I have that opportunity, I'm gonna do maintenance on the ACI. It's kind, of, it's kind of like one of those things, well, I'm not gonna come one day and perform maintenance on the substation transformer. Then two weeks later, I'm gonna perform a switch on the ACI. It's just not good work practice. You're going back and forth, back and forth. I'm gonna do everything at one time. So for or, in order for me to complete that, even though in my mind, let me take this away. I opened the automatic circuit interrupter, everything beyond is de-energized. In the real world, I can put a set of grounds on and I can work, but you're breaking a rule. It's not a, it's not a electrical problem, it's a rule problem. What rule am I breaking? I don't have two visual open points in the zone that I'm working. I'm gonna stress that a lot as, as we go along. Okay, any questions? Is there, a, is there a specific order in which you're supposed to open the switches? Yes, the yes. And you notice that we built out there in the field, we built a single line loop and we'll get into that is the specific order. You guys are gonna actually do what we call a uh, move of an open point, and you're gonna do a line clearance by radio. We're gonna use our phones, and we're, you're gonna to have to follow a specific procedure. You're gonna to have to write out the procedure on paper, and then you're gonna to have to follow that procedure in step process, okay? Uh, you do bring something up, and let me look at my time here. I, I want to get this substation squeezed in today. What time is it, V? It's uh, 10, 17. Okay, we're fine. Uh, <coughs> and I'll go ahead and stop my share here. We'll take another quick break. Uh, you know, when you're doing switching out there in the field and uh, you're working with a guy in a bucket truck, say he's an A-class lineman and you're a C-tech lineman, uh, who do you think opens and closes the switch? A class. No, no, no. All right. You're using a stick. 
And a stick's gonna have to be used all the time or you're on the ground with rubber gloves. I can guarantee you, uh, if the A tech lineman feels confident in what you're doing, he's gonna be sitting in the bucket truck in that nice warm heated bucket truck with a Coke and a pack of crackers. And he's gonna be, uh, I'm not joking with you. Okay. <laughs> He, he's going to be, you know, uh, sitting in there. He's going to be talking on the radio back and forth to dispatch. And when dispatch gives him the command to either open or close the switch, he's going to yell at you in the bucket truck where you're freezing your tail off, open that switch or close that switch. Uh, I, I want you guys to know as far as the C-Tech person, what you're doing in the process. All right. And that, that's why we're having this instruction that we're having here today. Uh, the big common, I wouldn't say common error, the big thing that you would assume is if you hear a dispatcher over a radio, one person at that location is in control. So let's say uh, Robbie is in control. He's in the truck. I'm up, I'm up in the bucket. And Robbie gets the command from dispatch. I'm ready for you to close the switch at pole one, two, three, four. He needs to read back that command to the dispatcher. The dispatcher needs to confirm with him that he received that command. And then he's going to give me instructions to open or close the switch. Yep. If I go outside of that process, say I'm listening to the radio too, and Robbie gets the command, close one, two, switch one, two, three, four, five. And I close that switch before he confirms it with the dispatcher. Uh, even though it might work and everything might be okay, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah. Bad trouble. Because you went outside of the process and uh, things can get nasty. Okay, let's take about 10. Another break. 10, 20. Okay. Three minutes and counting. Uh -huh. I've been watching a lot of Sean Connery, James Bond movies here lately. Oh, yeah. Seems how he's departed from us. That's the best James Bond there ever was. Con yeah, I'm with you, brother. Congratulations. They call me John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> oh. those, those are some good movies, though. Yeah, I do. I like those, too. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably walk away from him. <laughs> you, say you, you say you're going duck hunting, Tanner? Yeah. No, they call you Alma Fudd. Oh, nice. You want to go, Paul? Paul said he got jokes this morning. <laughs> you are a joke, my friend. He said you can't shoot. <laughs> well, we all got to get on Paul on the last day. I mean to tell you, he is really hammering you guys. Paul said he's going for that nick this morning, man. Get out of bed. Oh, terrible. Paul's had enough of y'all. He's coming for you. I hear you. It. <laughs> Young whippersnappers. Are we going out to the field today, Mr. Shoemaker? We are not. Yeah. No. Oh, I've been hard to spill. Well, I was hoping to be no. <laughs> Hey, well, um, I got homesick, you know what I'm saying? You're homesick? Yeah, I was missing home. And if I got homesick, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> you got a long way to go. A long way to go. I'd never make it to class. All right, so when, when are we doing that cookout thing at the field? Monday or Tuesday? I'll call y'all back later. Who, 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 you, who, you, who do you mean by y'all? I thought, aren't we having something at the field? I asked you guys if you were. I never got an answer back. I mean, I think we should. Okay. <clears throat> I'll talk to everybody. Let you know something. That's you. That's your ball of wax. You guys is 
you guys organize that. All right, it's 1030, so we'll go ahead and get started back. I've got my share screen back up. Yep. Should be back on the drawing, correct? Right on. All right, so we have uh, uh, gone through the transformer. We've gone through the low side switch. The next component we come to is the bus bar. And bus, uh, we'll talk about it when we get to the picture here. I'll show you after uh, we get off this share right here. Bus itself uh, comes in uh, three flavors. You've got what they call a flat bus, which is a flat piece of aluminum. A tubular bus, which is more like a tubular piece of conduit. And what they call strain bus. Strain is actual conductor. Bus, as you see it in this picture right here, is meant and designed to carry high amperage loads. So that's why we use bus bar and we don't use conductor all the time to be able to distribute, distribute high amounts of amperage and branch it out into different directions. So that is bus. What was that last bus called, the strain? Strain, yeah, like uh, S-T-R-A-I-N. Strain bus okay. is actually just strung conductor, okay? Yeah. The next component, and I'll just do red line because it's the same for all six that we have here in this picture. The next component we come to, so we've gone down the bus, we're gonna come up here and we're gonna co come to what, what we call this disconnect we have on this side. It's on the bus side. Bus, bus side disconnect switch. Bus side disconnect switch, that's a disconnect switch. We have the distribution breaker. The next component. Then we have this switch that's on the opposite side of the breaker. It's on our line side. So what do we call it? Line side disconnect. Line side disconnect. Then we have, and I know this looks like an open switch, the voltage regulator. Its purpose is to regulate voltage. And then we go out onto our feeder line. Okay. All right, let's see if you guys can put a little thought into this. Why do I need a bus side and line side disconnect? Why do those two components need to be there with my breaker in between? Follows the same rules that we just talked about over here. Why so do I need a high side switch and a low side switch? So you can safely replace breakers under the rules. There you go. Those, there you go. By the OSHA rules and your company rules, I need to have two visual open points to be able to work on this piece of equipment, the breaker itself, right? When a breaker opens and closes, stays open or stays closed, it's gonna give you an indication, all right? This is uh, something you need to keep in mind. Red equals what? Hot or dead? Hot. Hot, hot. yeah, remember, it's just like the candy, red hots. Green, Indication equals what? Dead. Dead. All right. Because it's required by the piece of equipment, you're going to have lighting. So there's going to be a light in there. Red light's going to be hot. Green light's going to be dead. You're also going to get a mechanical flag that comes up. And the, oh, when the red flag comes up on the breaker, it's, a, it's mechanical. When the red, red flag comes up, it's going to say closed. And when the green flag comes up, it's going to say open. These are all indications that are coming up on the breaker panel itself and on the outside of the breaker so you can visually see that. Now, question. With the breaker open, I'm going to have a green light and an open flag. Is that a visual? open point. On the breaker? 
Yes, sir. Yes. So you can see an open point with air in between it by looking at a green flag and a green light. No. There no. you go. Okay. That's why you have to add the added safety feature of having two visual open points before you can work on it. I mean, totally honest, guys, when the breaker does open, it's going to be de-energized. You're going to test it. It's going to be de-energized. All right, you're going to put a tick tracer to it to hot horn. You're not going to get anything, but you still you can't even ground it. You still can't do anything until you have in place two visual open points to be able to be, work on it. All right, that, that is monumental. It's not only monumental here. It's going to be monumental when you get out there in your career and you start working on lines. Visual open points on lines are required too for you, for you to be able to work on that. Okay, so we've been through all the components here on the drawing. I'm gonna go back to the share and show you them on a uh, actual picture. So, share screen, screen one, share. Don't start with this one, I, I already had it up and ready. That's my regulators, that's my ACI, I don't need that anymore. That's my substation transform, don't need it anymore, we've already gone by that. So the next component we came to uh, after we had left up before was bus, correct? Yeah. All right. There's plenty, gentlemen, plenty of bus pictures out there. I use this one. It's kind of blurry, I understand, but it had both components in it. You'll notice on this side, this is a round piece of aluminum pipe that's connected electrically. That's what I meant by tubular bus. Now, what's this piece of wire it is doubled up going to on this switch. What type of bus is this? Strain. Strain, there you go. It's got both buses in the same picture. So I've got tubular coupled with strain. Now, the reason why they're doing this here is uh, tubular is carrying the high amperage, but if I ever need to get it, <laughs> this is kind of a, you know, a manual way to do it. What do I need to do if I wanna work on this thing? What do I need to have? Two what? Open points. Visual open points. I'm able to disconnect here, disconnect here. Now I've got an air gap in between and I've got two visual open points. So, you know, even though it's not customary by a switch, I'm still able to fill the safety needs to be able to take care of it. Okay. So that was bus. Now we came up, what was the next one? What's the next component that we come to before the breaker? Bus side disconnect switch. Bus side disconnect switch. Okay. Now, obviously, it's going to be smaller and it's going to be mounted in this fashion vertically. How many phases do I have? One phase, two phase, or three phase? One. Okay. Remember, in the substation, transmission all the way through, I'm three phase all the way through. My feeder circuit is three phase. So how many of these switches am, am I going to need per breaker? Three. Three. Three of these switches per breaker. You'll notice also my insulation size has got much, much smaller. So now I'm, now I'm, I'm at a distribution voltage. So one per phase is mounted for the breaker. Now I'm going to make this really simple on you. I'm going to skip the breaker. Guess what kind of switch is used for the line side disconnect? Same kind? Same kind. Same exact switch. It's just mounted on the line side of the breaker. So how many of these am I going to need on the line side? Three. Three more. Six per breaker. I just had this picture up when you guys first started. Nope, 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 nope. nope. There you go. Perfect example. Okay. This is my, uh, I've got bus on the far side here. I know, I understand I got bus on this side also. You'll see the substation breaker here in the middle. It's kind of hard to see from this view. I've got one, two, three bus side disconnects on this side. And I've got one, two, three line side disconnects on the opposite side. So that's just a good photograph to show you how many, and this is just one single breaker sitting all by itself. Then I've got my regulators, 
and I go back out onto the line. So that'll give you a good example. Any questions there thus far? We're getting ready to bounce back to the breaker. I wanted to do bus side and line side all in one clip and skip the breaker just to let you know. Three installed on the bus side, three installed on the line side. Okay. The substation circuit breaker. Now I, I found this picture and I kind of like it because it has two variants going on here. One's a transmission breaker. One's a distribution breaker. Which is which? How can bigger. I tell how can I tell the difference just by looking at the picture? The bigger one is a transmission. Right. The bigger the insulator, the higher the voltage. So I know I'm into the transmission voltage range right here. The distribution one has much shorter, about half the size uh, bushings here on it. Okay, so I know my voltage is much lower. Uh, how am I able to distinguish that this is not a transformer? Because of the amount of bushings on the top? Well, the transformer, the substation transformer has six insulators on it. Let me see, did I kill that picture? I think I did. Nope, I didn't. All right, these are lightning arresters. So I've got one, two, three insulators right here, kind of obscured from review. I've got, and check this out. We'll use this one right here in the middle. You see how tall this one is? That's an insulator going in the transformer. That's an insulator going out of the transform. So I've got three lightning arresters, one, two, three, three transformer bushings, one, two, three, and three low side bushings, one, two, three, kind of scary from view. So that's six total bushings in the transformer. Go back to my breaker. How many do I have going in? How many do I have going out? Three in, three, three out. out, three out. But what's the difference in the bushings here? They're angled. No. I want you guys to look at size. How tall is this one? 10 feet. Yeah, at least. All right. How tall is this one? Six. Yeah, six, maybe five, half the distance. So I know here by this picture that I've got transformation going on. I'm coming in at a high voltage. I'm going out at a lower voltage. Take a look at the breaker. Is the all bushing of them, all, all of them the same size? There you go. All of them are the same size. My input voltage and my output voltage is the same. So there is no transformation going on here. I know then that this is now a breaker. Okay. Obviously, too, it's much smaller in size as far as what needs to be going on. This is just the control panel for it. But this is a substation breaker. My bushing size on one side is the same as the bushing size on the other side. That identifies it as a breaker. Okay. We'll get back to that in just a moment, depending on our time here is 1044. Uh, so we've gone bus side disconnect. Now we've included the breaker. We've got the line side disconnect. What's the piece of component next? Voltage regulator. Voltage regulator. And we discussed it just a little while ago. What's its purpose? To regulate voltage. All right, regulate voltage by how much? <laughs> gotcha. Plus or minus 5%. Excellent, thank you very much. There's not a lot of transformation going on here. All right, and I'm gonna use, we're typically using this and the bushes look right for it. Our typical voltage that we've been using is 7,200 volts, correct? Yes. So how yeah. much, so how much if I need to, how much can I raise it to? 7,200 times 5% or how much, you don't need to do the math, or 7,200 uh, minus 5%. So not a lot of transformation has to happen here. I just wanna be able to regulate that voltage within this range, all right? Another name, write this down for a voltage regulator is a auto transformer. 
So are the voltage regulators the reason why if you like put a meter in an outlet or something, you get like 122 or something like that? Uh, that's part of one thing, depending on how much load or amperage you have in the system. And yes, voltage regulators. And we'll get in just a moment of, of why they're used on a system. All right, I gave you another term here for a voltage regulator. What's it called? Auto transformer. Auto transformer. All right, so flip the words. It transforms voltage automatically. Automatically. I don't need to be at the substation to do this. And uh, once again, plus or five minus uh, plus or minus five percent on the system voltage that I'm using out there. Right, and I'll go into the reason why we're using those in just a moment. Just want to understand. Everybody understands what the voltage regulator is in a substation and its purpose to regulate voltage. Okay, no questions there. All right, so uh, we will jump back here. So I'm going to stop uh, that share and go to a new share. Share screen. This one. Uh, share. Okay, that covers all the components other than the feeder line. You guys know what feeder line is. Going out of a safe, up substation and out to my distribution feeder lines out there on the circuit. So I'm gonna start new. Oh, new. Don't save. Okay. So here's the purpose of a voltage regulator. And I'm gonna just do one, even though there are three on a circuit for you to understand. So I'm regulating voltage at a substation. Its purpose, you remember, I've got a feeder line that's coming out here and it's going all different directions. It's coming up in here until it eventually meets an open point. And then I've got a feeder coming from somewhere else. <coughs> The purpose of a voltage regulator on this entire circuit, remember, I've got transformers, I've got tap lines going off. All right, this thing's pretty loaded up. I've got a bunch of customers attached to this feeder circuit is I want to have plus or minus 5% at the beginning. All right, and what do I want to have at the end? Same, Same thing. Right. Percent. So what the voltage regulator is doing through SCADA, again, and through monitoring at the station is, I want my optimum voltage to be somewhere in the middle of my circuit to be 7200. Okay. I also don't want to be over 5% at the beginning. Voltage drops as you go down the entire circuit because one, of impedance and two, load that's on the circuit. I also, at the end of my circuit, don't wanna be below what? 5%. The minus 5% on my circuit. So that's why you have voltage regulation that goes up and down. Now, why would you think voltage would change on a circuit just through the course of one day? I get up this morning, it's 52 degrees. Uh, the heaters are running. Everybody's taking a shower, getting ready for work. Is my voltage gonna be high or low? Yeah. It's gonna be low. I'm gonna to need to start regulating up my voltage a little bit. All right, it warms up to a nice 72 degree day. Everybody's left the house. They're at the office doing their work. What do you think the voltage is gonna do? It's gonna raise. So what do I need to do to it? Lower it at the substation. All right, I need to keep it within plus or minus 5%. That's the purpose of a voltage regulator on your system. Make sense? I hope it makes sense. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Remember the rule also, and this is, you know, voltage regulation on a circuit is very closely monitored. And this goes back to the general rules we learned in electricity. When I raise my voltage, what happens to my amperage? It drops, okay? That's good for my entire circuit. 
I don't want to overload my circuit, right? When my voltage lowers, what happens to my amperage? It raises, and you don't want your voltage to get so low, so low that your amperage is too high and overloads your circuit. Okay, so and again, that's another reason why you have voltage regulation, and really it explains in its entirety why it has to be automatic. There is no way that a person can sit there all day long and say, oh, I see the amperage going high. I need to raise my voltage to try to lower it or vice versa. That's why it's got to be fully automated when that process happens. All right. There is some background stuff going on here too. And uh, companies, who's ever heard of, uh, what do they call it, Robbie, like the smart network? Oh, yeah, that's... Um... Golly, can't think of it right off yet. I know yeah. they call they call it like the smart network or smart net. Uh, yeah. we, we did start the process out there in St. Cooper just in the testing phase. And what was happening here now, why does a meter turn? What drives a meter to turn? Voltage or amperage? Amperage. Amperage, amperage makes the meter turn, right? I could have voltage going to it all day long, but until I start, start turning the lights on and making that meter turn through amperage, you know, wattage being used, amperage flowing into the house, that meter's not going to turn off, all right? It's a great, I don't want to say contact, concept, it's a great process that if I can get my voltage just low enough here to be able to stay within the 5% here, when I lower my voltage, what happens to my amperage? It raises. It raises your amperage. Everybody's meter is going to do what? Spin. Spin. Turn. Right. It, right. And we'll take it like this. If I got 120 volts, Right, that, and I'm using five amps. I'm just, I'm not really actually going to do, do Ohm's law here just for the speed of it. All right, from a light at 120 volts, and that's my nominal voltage. If I lower that down to say 117, my amps is going to go up to 5.7. I'm just throwing some numbers out there. Is that making my meter spin faster? No. Yep. Is my voltage within the range? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, how are you paying your bill? How much your meter runs. There you go. Think of it, guys. Think of the concept. And what they'll do on systems here is at the voltage regulator, they'll put a communications component. And along the line, they'll put what they call smart meters. All through these areas right through here, all the way to the end. Not on every house, but through you know major distances or you know design distances there in the system, and this meter will send information back to the breaker. I'm at 117. Okay, everything's copacetic, and that and I'm at uh, 122. Everything's kind of good right there. Voltage drops through the circuit. All right, he's gonna with the regulator. This communication right here. What the regulator is going to try to do at the substation is lower that voltage down and let's see, 125, 114 is the lowest voltage I can go and stay within the plus or minus 5%. So if the system sees this right here and says, you know, I can actually go down a little bit in my voltage and that's gonna make the meters spin faster on my entire circuit and I'm able to make more money, all right? Make sense? Smart net, smart net. Okay. All right, what time are we holding there, Professor V? Uh, 10.54. 10.54, okay, it gives us a couple of minutes to clean up uh, tests and quizzes and everything like that. So that's gonna be uh, it for today, you guys. Uh, there's no test today, no quiz today. Um, guys had a pretty good week. Most of you had a pretty good week here. Yeah. So uh, this video will be posted up. We'll get started next Monday. Into, into some more stuff. I'm looking at Zoom for uh, Monday morning uh, and we will be able to go out to the field 
uh, Monday afternoon, and we're going to start looking at some of these components as far as the feeder side is concerned with uh, switch designs and switch locations, what they call a dead blade disconnect, a GOAB, a fuse disconnect, and whatnot to get those components down also. Any questions? All right, don't anybody leave yet. I got a question. Yes, sir. Um, on that circuit, before you get to the feed lines from the voltage regulator, I notice there's no switch. So if, if you ever needed to work on a voltage regulator and maybe replace, how would that be done? And if so, how do you control the voltage through the circuit to all the businesses that take the power? Okay. When you've got the first open point on the, uh, let's say like this. Hold on. Say you've got your open point on that line side disconnect. Yeah. It's a, uh, and some people, some organizations do design it this way. They'll go ahead and put the disconnect on the uh, other side. So let me just draw that in red. Okay. They will put a disconnect there. If they do, do not, it's just a manual unbolting. Just unbolt the conductor from the feeder line to the uh, regulator. That gives you a new open point because there's no, uh, what do you call it? There's no load. Load can't go anywhere. Okay. So it's just a regular unbolting of the regulator. Now, as far as say I did do, need to do that maintenance and I'm just gonna do it here as an O. So I unbolted it from the uh, regulator. I've got an open point on this side. In order for me to, and this is the one that I put here earlier, in order for me to now regulate the circuit, I've got to use the other substation that I tied to over here. Okay. Otherwise all these, so this open point would leave. That's, that's gonna take switching to take out an entire circuit. Is that a common thing? Uh, not, I wouldn't say common. It happens. It happens. Uh, and you gotta think, I mean, a voltage regulator is doing, and through SCADA and through on-site observations, it, it counts how many times it had to change steps or how, how many times it had to regulate voltage. And after a certain amount of steps or a certain amount of re regulation changes, it's going to have to have the oil change to be maintained. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, it does happen. So the, the whole circuit would work the same way, like an underground fault, and you'd have to re-energize it from the other side to keep Exactly, power. exactly. That's on feeders only. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we'll get into that further. Uh, some companies... Uh, don't have that much redundancy. Some companies are gold-plated, and I have to admit, Santi Cooper was gold-plated on redundancy. Mm -hmm. I've drawn you a simplistic uh, diagram right here as far as one circuit from this substation on the left tying with another one out here on the right-hand side. Uh, depending on the density of the population in the area, you might have another circuit coming from another substation here and here, I mean, you might have four or five different tie points yeah. in one circuit to be able to tie with other uh, substations and breakers. It can get very elaborate. Okay, any other questions? All right, so everybody just hold one more moment because I need to speak with some people before they everybody leaves. Uh, Professor V, do you need to catch anybody? Uh, we're good. You are? Yeah, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Jacob Hyman and uh, Blake Remillard, I need you to stay after before uh, anybody leaves. Uh, Caleb Radcliffe. Okay. Right. He is. It sounds like he has already departed the scene. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm here. Okay, uh, make sure that uh, you get that the presentation squared away like I asked. You, you did send it in on time. I'm just ain't unable to open it. Yes, yeah, sir, I'll send it in. Okay, thank you very much. All right, gentlemen, that is it for the day. No quizzes today, no yard today. Uh, go home, do what you need to do. Have a good weekend. Take care.